Hi everyone, um, our next speaker is Mark Bishop. Mark Bishop is going to be giving us a talk on robotics, me mechanical bodies, mythical minds and mysterious dangers. Round of applause for Mark Bishop, please. Good afternoon and uh, thank you to Campus Party and the O2 and all the organisers for extending an invite to me to come to speak to you today. Uh, I'd like to take the next 45 minutes to talk to you about robotics, but not necessarily the, the fine detail of how robots uh, move in the world or sense the world or act the world, but the way that they might impact our society, the potential, some of the potential good things that might happen about robotics and some of the potential dangers that I see arising from the widespread use of robotics. Well, when discussing the place of robots in society, typically these two key themes will often emerge. The idea of the robots leading to some future sort of cyber heaven, where robots will go and beaver away and do all the sorts of jobs that we don't like doing. And also the sort of Terminator-esque view of robots leading to some cyber hell, where humankind is eventually subjugated by a race of rampant Terminators that intent on the extermination of mankind. And it was in this context um, viewing the robot as a facilitator and the destroyer, that in the 1960s the poet Richard Brautigan uh, had a vision um, and created a poem called All Watched Over by Machines of Living Grace, where he describes this future cyber utopia. Was filled with pines and electronics, where deer stole peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I like to think. It has to be of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and joined back to nature, returned to our mammal brothers and sisters, and all watched over by machines of loving grace. Well, ever since the word robot was first introduced to us by the interwar Czech playwright Karel Kapek with his play play Rossum's Universal Robots, the common conception of a robot has been some kind of engineered golem, a machine that we can use to take out some of the drudgery of everyday life. And it was in that view that, um, and, the, and it was in that concept that uh, laid the context of Brautigan's vision of the robot as helper. So nearly half a century after Richard Brautigan composed that poem, how far have we got along with the notion that robots are going to be everywhere, going to be helping us in our everyday lives? Well, one of the most widely known about applications of robots in society has been when we use robots in, for example, production lines, in assembly lines. And here's an example of, if I can use the, uh, the cursor, here's an example of a Fanuc robot assembling cars, the sort of things you've probably seen countless times. So these are large fixed robotic systems that are programmed to do a series of actions time and time again. They do them very accurately and don't go on strike. So robots are kind of inching their way into the workplace. A robot that you might have become me more familiar with is the notion of a robot at home and one of the most common fielded applications of robotics at home have been this type of device. The new must-have personal robots that we're using to mow our lawns, to um, hoover our carpets and to clean our floors. Now, these are a very different sort of robot to the sort of robot that people envisaged in the 1950s and the sort of robot that Richard Brautigan thought about that would be interfacing with our lives, the bipedal robot interacting with a normal human society. The robot at home was originally imagined in this kind of shape. Bipedal, interacting, interacting with people at a human scale and at a human level. And yet, although these machines have been tested in the labs, for example, in Kirsten, by Kirsten Dertenham's group at the University of Hertfordshire, these machines have yet to make a big impact in everyday life. And I'd like to put to you the question of why that might be. Why is it that we're not seeing, 50 years after, after Brautigan first penned that poem, why are we not seeing robots like this in the home to do 
the sort of everyday jobs that we hate, the washing up, the ironing, the cleaning. Why are we not seeing these robots being fielded? Is there some particular reason for that? And I'd like to suggest to you this afternoon that there might be. Now, in the same 50 years that have moved us from Brotigan to now, although we haven't seen many great uh, steps made into seeing robots fielded in everyday life around the home, we have seen the notion of the robot as a destroyer begin to take ground. And robots have already begun to carve quite a niche for themselves in the army. So some of you might have seen this video of the big dog robot. I can get it to play. This is an incredible piece of engineering. Um, it's designed to take uh, loads off squaddies into dangerous battlefield situations. Here we see the big dot throwing a large lump of concrete. Now, as somebody spent a lot of time designing robots, the engineering that's gone into that machine is quite stupendous. It's a very difficult task for a robot to do. That's happened. That, this technology is here and it's here now. Now, as well as robots on the battlefield, we've already seen a more scary sort of robot that's fielded on all American naval ships. This is the Phalanx Close-In Weapon System. Now, this particular weapon system is a genuinely autonomous system. When the commander of the ship switches it on, from that moment on, this robot will scan the skies for threats to that ship. When it sees a potential threat, it will target that threat and it will decide for itself, without further human intervention, whether to engage that threat or not. If it decides to engage, it will open up with some very high-speed machine guns and take out that threat before the missile hits the ship. Now, these have been very successfully used for over 20 years and, as I said, they're, on, they're deployed now on all American um, surface ships. More recently, you might have seen the Israeli Iron Dome system. This is, again, a fully autonomous system. When it's switched on, the moment this system is switched on, this system for itself will make decisions about targeting threats to Israel. It's been designed to intercept incoming Palestinian uh, rockets coming into the state of Israel and to take them out. Once it's switched on, it will make a decision to target a, a, a suspected enemy missile, engage it and take it out without further human intervention. So these sort of systems I'm talking about now are, are semi-fully autonomous robot systems. Once they've been switched on, they operate without further human uh, intervention. And <coughs> kind of more alarmingly, there's another, another example of this sort of system I'd like to show you now. This is from South Korea. It's, it's manufactured by Samsung. It's called the Samsung SGR-A1 robot and it's designed as a robot border guard. So apologies for the video, it's in Korean. I don't know whether you speak Korean. Um, but this system has been designed to take the place of humans manning the demilitarized zone in Korea. The job of the system is to look for potential insurgents coming across the, de the demilitarized zone, shout a warning to them, and then to alert a, a, a teleoperator, say, look, I've detected somebody, it looks like a threat at the border, and then if the operator so desires, he can press a button and tell this system to engage the target. Now that sounds kind of scary enough, but things are a little bit worse than they seem at first hand, because this SDR system has another mode. It has a fully autonomous mode. If you flick a switch, this thing can work completely on its own. Once it's installed and armed, scanning the horizon for, for insurgents, it will, if it sees the target, it will shout out a warning, and if that person doesn't engage with the robot, it will and has the capability to take that person out. Now, if you think about it, that's kind of dangerous in the particular situation where this is being deployed in the DMZ in the South Korean demilitarized zone. It's, a it's an area of extreme high tension, one of the riskiest places on the planet. You can imagine if this thing gets it wrong, 
the potential escalations that might happen. Say, uh, uh, say a, a North Korean accidentally goes into the DMZ and doesn't respond appropriately to a challenge from the system and is then taken out. That will cause a great rise in tension. But the problem gets even worse if you imagine that North Korea also invests in this technology. Imagine there are armies of this, this type of device facing each other along, along the border. Once, something start, once a chain of motion is set in place, you can see this thing quickly escalating and getting out of control. And in areas like Korea, this is a particularly dangerous scenario. Well, <clears throat> as well, I, I, I wear various hats in my professional uh, day job. I'm a professor of computing at, um, cognitive computing at Goldsmiths, the University of London. And I also chair the UK Society for Artificial Intelligence and the Simulation of Behaviour, the AISB. The AISB is the oldest society for work into AI in the world. We've been around for a very long time, and in fact it's our 50th anniversary next year. As well as that, I'm the director of a centre in radical cognitive science, and more of that later. But I also work for a society called ICRAC, the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. We're a group of people who are seriously worried about the future deployment of semi-autonomous systems of the sort I've just been describing to you. The people involved in ICRAC tend to be scientists and engineers who've worked on the cutting edge, as I have, of robotics research. We know what robots are really capable of and we know their limitations. And the fact that the military are now beginning to field robots on a wide scale gives us cause for alarm. Kind of to counterbalance this, there is humanitarian law that applies whenever systems want to use force on the battlefield. And humanitarian law states that in deploying armed force, it's got to be clear that the use of force is appropriate in this, some particular scenario. It's necessary. The use of force has got to be proportionate to the threat. And the systems that deploy force have always got to be capable of distinguishing competence from non-competence, so you don't just blindly take out everybody. Now these are very difficult issues for humans to resolve. I don't know whether you can see on that picture up there, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an armed terrorist in that group. Can anyone easily see who it is? It's not, I wouldn't say it's a simple task to make. So these are difficult decisions for humans to make. What grounds have we for believing that computers will be able to do these things better than we can? In my opinion, we have very few grounds for making that choice. So, <clears throat> there are basically, when we think about the use of robots in warfare, there are, there are the three basic worries. Can a machine reliably and accurately decide when it's appropriate to use armed force? I'm not so sure it can. Can a machine reliably and accurately decide what's proportionate force to use in response to a threat? I'm not convinced that a machine can do that. And can a machine reliably distinguish competence from non-competence? I'm not convinced that at the moment a machine can do any of those three things. But as well as those basic dangers about the technology, there are worse dangers that can apply when we start to use robots on the battlefield. And one of these more serious dangers that actually poses an existential threat to human survival on the planet is this problem of escalation that I alluded to when I was talking to you about the Samsung SGR Border Patrol robot. To illustrate how computational systems can go badly wrong and things can start to escalate, I want to take you to, through a couple of scenarios. One kind of humorous, one kind of scary. The first of these scenarios describes a scenario that happened a couple of years ago. In fact, it's still ongoing. If you go and check out this book on Amazon, the last time I checked this a few weeks ago, you can still see this phenomenon happening now. <coughs> the first of these scenarios describes a situation on Amazon to do with two of Amazon's resellers. One's called Bordy Books, and one was called Profnaf. Now, Profnaf happened to have a copy of a book by Peter Lawrence called The Making of a Fly. Now, this book, when it was printed, cost $70. Typical academic textbook, that's kind of the going right. Now, <coughs> Profnaf had a copy of this book in stock, 
but they had a software robot, a bot. These are robots that don't inhabit the physical world, they inhabit some virtual space. These are bots. So this software robot was inhabiting the Amazon virtual marketplace and it was scanning that marketplace to see what price was being set by books it had in store with a view to marketing its book at a slightly cheaper price. I believe that the algorithm was something like Prof Naf would look to see who was if it had a book like The Making of a Fly and a competitor was selling it for one dollar, it would sell it for 90 cents. Now, <clears throat> Bordy Books, on the other hand, were a, a much larger firm. They, they traded a lot on reputation and their bot used to do sort of futures selling. They would invest in books they didn't own. And the way that they would do that, they would look to see who was selling a book, like The Making of a Fly by Peter Lawrence, and they would see what price they could get it for, and then they would advertise it for, say, 1.2 times the, the price they could buy it for. So if they thought, saw a book for sale for a dollar, they would advertise it on their site for $1.20, knowing that if someone bought it, they could buy it from the other site and then resell it on at a tasty profit. Now you can see where this, what's going to happen, can't you? When you have these two bots bidding against each other, you suddenly found a couple of years ago that a book that was originally priced at $70, because these systems are just stupid two robot systems bidding against each other, this created an escalation, an exponential escalation in the price. And I've got a screen grab here that shows this book retailing at $2.1 million. It actually, the final price, the highest price I saw it at, was $23 million this book was being advertised at. Now this, this stupid escalation happened because you have two dumb machines bidding against each other without any human oversight. The most half awake of shop assistants who'd seen that escalation happen would have pressed the pause button. That would not have been allowed to happen, but it did happen. And as I said, that, was, that process was still going on a few weeks ago when I last checked. Now you might think that kind of escalation so on is vaguely amusing, no one's really going to spend $23 million on a book, it doesn't really affect me at all. Well, systems when they go wrong through automatics can, uh, automatic systems interacting with each other can affect you. Most people in the room have probably heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis from the early 1960s, where mankind faced Armageddon straight in the face. What you might not be aware of, that there was a similar existential threat to mankind in 1983, when <clears throat> NATO was engaged in a big war exercise called Operation Able Archer at a time of heightened tension with the Soviet bloc. Now at that time, the Soviet censors and spies returned back to Soviet HQ incorrect data. And the, some of this data indicated that America was in the process of launching a first strike against Russia. The colonels were then instructed to immediately launch a counter-strike. This is a nuclear counter-strike and this happened in 1983. And this isn't a game, this allegedly we came within a hair's breadth of nuclear Armageddon because the instruction was made to launch a counter-strike. The only reason that didn't happen is that a mid-ranking Soviet colonel realised that Something had gone wrong. He did not believe that America had taken this first strike against Russia and he entered the codes, the launch codes, incorrectly, thus preventing Armageddon. Now you imagine if a human hadn't been in the loop to make that decision, we wouldn't be here now. So when you've got computational systems, dumb computational systems, interacting with each other, you have this danger of escalation where things can happen really rapidly and get out of hand really quickly. And when these are coupled with weapon systems, you have serious dangers to confront in the context of the future of humanity. And that's why the group of us got together called ICRAC, the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. And we, we suggest to you that because of the inherent limitations of computational systems, that in the absence of clear scientific evidence that robot weapons have or are likely to have in the foreseeable future the functionality required for accurate target identification, situational awareness or decisions regarding the proportional use of force, we question whether they would ever strictly meet the strict international legal requirements for the use of force. 
So we're trying to campaign against the future deployment of more autonomous weapon systems. Now, as I showed you earlier on, some of these systems are already in place and there won't be any going back. The phalanx is there now on all the American surface ships. We've got to accept that. So those of us in the committee, we're not trying to make this retrospective. We're just trying to stop people developing and arms, uh, arms companies developing and deploying more of these autonomous weapon systems because the dangers we feel are just too great. So why has it proven so much easier to build robots that can be quite successful at blowing things up and killing people on the battlefield than it has to build an, robots that can be useful around the home or in the everyday world of human interactions and meaning? Why should, why should that be? Are there any reasons that behind the... Uh, relative poverty of sophisticated human-robot interaction that we see at the moment around the world. Well, I think there are, and I want to sort of complete the few words I want to say to you today by just going through a few of the reasons that I see that are uh, inhibiting the wider deployment of robot systems at the moment. The first of these three things I'd like to spend the most time talking to you about it's something I'm particularly interested in. It's an argument from an American philosopher called John Searle. And it's called the Chinese Room Argument. And if John's correct, this argument suggests that robots can't understand anything now. And worse than that, no robot ever will. A few years ago, I, uh, the, uh, the argument was first published in 1980. And in 2002, I put together a, a collection of essays reviewing the academic thought at that point in time about John Searle's argument then. And I want to take you through a few of the insights that came out of that project. But first of all, I want to take you through the argument itself. <clears throat> Just before 1980, John Searle, this American philosopher, had been given a kind of sabbatical, a kind of like leave of absence from his work and he'd been invited to spend some time in an AI lab. And he went to work uh, in the labs of Shank and Abelson in America. Now, Shank and Abelson were two AI scientists who'd been working on developing artificially intelligent systems that allegedly can understand stories. Now, when I say stories, I don't mean stories like War and Peace or Lord of the Rings. I mean stories of the form Jack and Jill went up the hill to get a pail of water. What did Jack and Jill go up to get from the top of the hill? <laughs> Can someone remind me? What, what, so I will ask you, if you understood that story, what did Jack or Jill go up to get? A pail of water. Now, Shank and Abelson's program could take stories of that complexity and people could ask them questions, like, if they, if they said Jack and Jill went up the hill, you could say, who went up the hill? And the program would reply, Jack and Jill went up the hill. And you could say, why did Jack and Jill go up the hill? And the program would reply, to get a pail of water. Now, I, now established academics are fairly, normally fairly cautious people. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that Shank and Abelson made the following claims about their work. But postgraduate students, the people who normally are working at the coalface in AI labs around the world, are not so reserved. And some of Shank and Oberson's doctoral students, his grad students, began to make strong claims about this program that Shank and Oberson had built that allegedly understood stories. They said to John Searle, here we have for the first time an AI system that genuinely understands in just the same sort of way that you or I do. This system understands stories in just the sort of ways that you or I do. And John Searle's a clever guy and he sort of investigated, he talked to Shanklin and Ebersen about how their system worked. I'll give you a brief background now. Their system worked by using things called scripts. And what a script is in computing terms, it's a set of stereotypical expectations that unfold over time. So a restaurant script might be, go to a restaurant, open the door, look for a spare table, sit down at the table, pick up a menu, choose something to eat, order it from the waiter, 
scoff your food, pay for your food and away you go. That's the sort of thing I mean, a set of stereotypical expectations that unfold over time. That's a script. So Shank and Nobleton's programme had a big library of scripts over all different sort of things that might happen. In going to the restaurant, in buying things from the shops, all sorts of things. And <coughs> it, the, their system used these scripts and some simple natural, natural language understanding systems to interrogate stories and give appropriate answers to these stories. And as I said, the claim from Shankar Leberson's postgraduate students was that this system genuinely understood these stories just the same way that you or I might do. So John Searle imagined the following scenario that tried to suggest this was nonsense. John Searle is a typical American, monoglot American speaker, can he only speak English? And he imagined being locked in a room in China, hence the name of the experiment, the Chinese room experiment. Imagine being locked in a room in China. And in this room, he saw three piles of papers. One, two, three. And these piles of papers had symbols inscribed on them, squiggles and squoggles, and it meant nothing to him. And also in the room, there was a big fat book. And in this book, this book was, there were symbols, but this book was written in English. And John Searle can read English so he could understand the instructions in this book. And what the instructions in this book tell him to do is that if you see a, a shape of this type in bucket one and a shape of that type in bucket two, then put a third shape in bucket three. If you see a shape of a particular type in bucket two and another one in bucket three, hand out a shape through the slot in the door to people in the outside world. Well, after a while, John Searle, when he followed through this rule books, he got to be able to do this really, really well and really, really accurately. But of course, unbeknownst to Searle, these symbols in pile one were a story in Chinese. They're written in Chinese ideographs. The symbols in, in pile two were a script about that story. And the symbols in pile three were questions about that story in Chinese. And the symbols he was outputting through the slot in the door to people in the outside world were answers to those questions in Chinese. But, and the thing that the book that he was reading was a program. So Searle, by following this, the rules in this book, was responding to questions about that story in Chinese, giving answers that were indistinguishable from those a native Chinese person might give, even though he himself trenchantly insists he doesn't understand a word of Chinese. So this seems to suggest, Searle says, that no matter how good the computer program is, it will never genuinely understand anything. It might appear to understand something, but it won't genuinely understand something. I don't know whether any of you got a younger brother or sister, but if you have, you might have been in a scenario, say at a dinner party, having a few drinks, when an adult joke has been, uh, has been made. And everybody around the table laughs. And the little brother or sister, six or seven year old, also joins in the laughter, even though you know damn well they haven't got the joke. This is the kind of thing that Searle's suggesting. That a computer might give the simulation of understanding, but it never really understands. So that's one reason why I don't believe, why I believe that uh, we, we're not seeing robots in open scenarios interacting with humans around the home because they don't understand anything. When the robot manipulates something, he doesn't know it's an apple any more than a banana or an elephant or a rhinoceros. It's just doing a set of pre-programmed blind symbol manipulations. Now, the second reasons I think prove difficult to, uh, challenges to get for roboteers to overcome to get robots fielded in our society arose in the mid 1980s with the publication of three critical books about artificial intelligence and robotics. These were books by Dreyfus and Dreyfus, Mind Over Machine, uh, Winograd and Flores, Understanding Computers in Cognition, and Lucy Suckman, Plans and Situated Actions. Now their, their arguments are really complicated, I don't propose to go into them now. But the take home point you can take the three, three people made is that they said it's very difficult to, to abstract human interaction, human machine interactions from the context of that interaction. Perhaps if I 
give you a bit of backstory about Lucy Sukman's work. It might help to shape what I mean. Lucy was an anthropologist, and in the early 80s, she got a great secondment to Palo Alto Labs, the rank Xerox in America. And there, she's begun work, she, she got seconded to work on some projects that involved developing super-duper photocopiers. Now, at that point in time, if Xerox did a photocopier and HP did a photocopier, photocopies were sold on the list of functions they could do. The more functions your photocopier you had over the opposition, the more photocopies you hoped you would sell. So photocopier manufacturers were building bigger and bigger and bigger and more complex and more complex machines. And these are being sold. But when they sell them, they found a really bizarre thing. Most of the people that bought these copiers barely used any of the functions on them. If these machines had, could do 100 things, 99 of the photocopies they ever sold would only be used to do three things. And that's because the complexity to drive them went up through the roof. So at the labs at Palo Alto, Lucy was charged with the task, can we use artificial intelligence to make the human-machine interaction simpler so that people will be able to use our complicated super-duper photocopies to do a wide range of things really easily. And to cut to the chase, what Lucy found is no. Because human computer scripts effectively have to be programmed for particular scenarios and they're very inflexible or bristle is the word that we use when they're faced with the broad range of human computer interactions that we actually meet in the office. In other words, that this is actually an insurmountable problem and it's to do with the richness and the social embeddedness of human-machine interactions, which, he, which machines just can't grasp. Now, the third and final um, reason I wanted to allude to today for why um, machines have had a barrier to... to uh, why we're we not seeing robots in use uh, in the home and widely in human uh, interactions and in society is because I put it to you that machines aren't conscious. A computer can't be conscious. We can't instantiate consciousness merely by the execution of some computer program. Now, if we can't, if a machine can't feel, if it can't be conscious like you or I, I suggest to you that it can't really have its own desires. If a machine can't feel hunger, it won't have a need to sate its hunger. If it, can't, if it can't feel that it wants something, it can't put a plan in place for itself to go try and achieve that something. So because computers are not fundamentally, in my view, because computers can never be conscious, my claim is that they can never really have desire. And if they can't really have desires, then they can't really have their own what we call technically teleological behaviour. What we mean by that is they can't have their own, their own goal-directed behaviours. Now, of course, that's not to say that the engineer could hardwire into a machine that it might want to do something. You can imagine some sort of future James Bond, James Bond villain paying for a big army of robots to take over the world and when these robots were being built, he could insist they were designed to go out and hunt and shoot humans because he programmed them or he forced them to be programmed in that way. But that desire then isn't the robot's own desire, it's a desire of the engineer who built the machine. My claim is that without, um, without having their own consciousness, um, a robot can't have a desire for itself. And so the robot will forever remain empty of grace. Now I've whizzed through this a little bit quicker than I have to. I, what, what I've now got the time to take you through is to show you why I don't think a robot can be conscious. I wasn't certain I'd have time to do this, but I have, so that's all good. Oops. So I'll just skip through. So why might it be that a robot can't be conscious? Well, if, it, well if, we, if we did have conscious robots, then we can imagine that the Hollywood vision of the future robot dystopia populated by Terminator machines might be a realistic possibility. I'm going to suggest to you that that's not going to be the case. 
But before I do that, when I talk about machine consciousness, some people say to me, well, who the hell takes that seriously anyway? Who really seriously believes that the mere execution of a computer program in a machine will give rise to something that can see and feel like you or I? In other words, am I attacking a straw man? Well, I suggest to you that I'm not because the view that machine consciousness can happen, machine consciousness is the view that there's something it is like to be, there's a subjective aspect to the dynamic execution of a particular computer program. Well, this view is certainly academically reputable because there's an international academic journal of machine consciousness. So there certainly is at least some people who take this notion very seriously. And I've got two videos that will show you some systems that have been designed with this in place. Right, the first is of a very simple robot designed at the University of Reading by a team led by Professor Kevin Warwick. This is bad quality video of a machine he called one of his seven dwarves. Now what this robot can do, and I don't know how clear it is from this poor video, but the machine can run around very rapidly and not bump into things. Wow. But the interesting thing about the machine is that it learned to do this for itself. Getting a little bit carried away. Pause that now. So this little machine, it's got three wheels, two motors at the back. It's got a little brain on it. And this brain is powered by some technology that we call neural networks. What neural networks are are very, very crude simulations of how we believe the sorts of processes your brains instantiate. So they're like rough approximations to how we currently believe the brain might work. So with this particular robot, Kevin put a large neural network on board. And this robot had some primitive sensors. It had some ultrasonic sensors that told the robot how far away it was from obstacles. So it had one at the front, one at the right-hand side, and one at the left-hand side. So the robot had three sense bits of sense information coming to it, telling it how far away it was from obstacles. Aside from that, it had the neural network, and it was told one thing when it was switched on. It was told it's great fun to go as fast as possible. So that's the only thing that was hardwired into this robot. Going fast is great. That's the only thing that it was told at the beginning. Given that, it was told going forward fast is great. This neural network learned for itself how to match sensor data with commands to control the, ro the wheels of the robot so that the robot could move around really, really fast and not bump into things. Now, the neural network that was used in this system had several hundred neurons on board, artificial neurons, and Kevin Warwick famously claimed of that system, and this was designed ooh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago now, said here we have a robot that is genuinely conscious, it's as conscious as a slug. He said it's got the same number of neurons as a, as a simple animal like a slug or a nematode worm, and he said it's purely human bias. If you say of a nematode worm that it can move around and not bump into things and it has some sort of conscious life, if my robot with the same size neural network can do that, it's purely human bias if you're going to say this biological system can be conscious and not my machine system. So Kevin was fairly strident about that. He was very convinced that, that there we have already a system that's conscious. Oops. Now the second system I wanted to show you was by Professor Owen Holland and this machine is called Kronos and this is a robot that's modelled on the human skeleton so it wibbles and wobbles it's powered by little tendons controlled by motors and you'll see the thing move around and it can go and grab things, lift things up in its environment why did Owen suggest that this might be a conscious robot? Well, as well as designing the Kronos robot, Owen also designed, using some state-of-the-art games engines, a software simulation of Kronos and the environment that Kronos was in. So you can imagine, there's the real Kronos. 
in the lab next door, there's a little virtual reality system running, which has got a very detailed representation of Kronos and Kronos's immediate environment. So when Kronos was, Kronos was told to grab the ball at the left of the table, what they would do in the VR simulator, they would do all sorts of different actions until they found a sequence of actions that would grab the ball and successfully move the ball around according to the command to Kronos. It would do that in kind of Kronos' imagination in this virtual reality simulator. And, and Owen basically said that when you have a robot that has its own inner model of itself and its environment, well, that's really all that consciousness is. So this system, the, the Kronos robot on its simulator Simonos, were the first steps, said Owen Holland, to building genuinely conscious robots. <coughs> And Owen was very successful in designing these robots and attracted a lot of very competitive and hard to achieve research funding for these projects. In the UK, over several million and also large grants from the European Union to develop these ideas. So these ideas are being taken very seriously. So in other words, machine consciousness is by no means a straw man. Right, to show you, to finish off with, to show you that machine consciousness is not very likely, I want to run you through an argument which I've called dancing with pixies. What this purports to show is that if, it's, if machine consciousness actually happens when you run an, a computer program, then consciousness is everywhere. And to introduce this, I want to take you to um, a machine that Alan Turing designed, a very simple machine called the three-state discrete state machine. And it was basically a big wheel. And this wheel turned round and it could exist in one of three positions. That's why we say it's a discrete state machine. It could exist in one of three positions only. And these positions we can call P1, P2 and P3. And what Turing showed is that we can ascribe a computational state to each of these three positions this wheel could be in. Let's call these computational states Q1, Q2, and Q3. And we can see this system running. He's a very simple simulation of Turing's machine. And you'll see that whenever the machine is in state Q1, we can engineer it. So when this machine's in computational state Q1, a light will come on. So here we have the system running goes from state Q1, Q2, Q3, Q1, Q2, Q3, and it will keep on doing that forever. So it's not a very interesting computational device, but nonetheless is it, it is a device when the machine's in a certain state it will cause something to happen, a light to come on. Now what Turing showed is that if we um, reassign those computational states so that state Q1 is now not, no longer at the vertical position but perhaps at the four o'clock position, we can get exactly the same computational behaviour. So again, when the machine's in state Q1, the light will come on. When it's in Q2 and Q3, it won't. Given that we're in state Q1 now, we can predict, we'll next go to state Q2 and then Q3 and then back to Q1. In other words, if we know the mapping between the physics of the system and the computational states, we can reliably predict how this future behaviour of this machine will evolve over time. But the key take home point is that the computational states are always mapped onto the physical states of the system. And unless we know that mapping, we can't say what computation the system is actually undergoing. And basically what the Dancing with Pixies Redux show that I've developed shows, that if you have a program like Kevin's Seven Dwarf Robot, which is claimed to be conscious as it moves around its environment, if we store in a big list, all the input values to that little robot as it moved around. And then we present them back to the robot at some future time. If the robot was conscious when it first moved around on its own, when we present it, the same data again, a little while later, but this time that we're giving it, not that it's found for itself from its environment, then the claim is the robot must be conscious again. It must be conscious in exactly the same way. But if we know the input to the robot, then we've no longer got the robot executing a normal computer program, we've got the robot effectively just going through a series of state transitions over time. And because lots of things can go through state transitions over time, counters like you see in a car, myelometer, 
In fact, anything, even this rock or the floor, go through different state transitions over time. If we know the mapping between the states of the computer system and the counter, we can make a counter behave in exactly the same way as Kevin Warwick's Seven Dwarf or the Kronos robot. And so if it's the case that the Seven Dwarfs is a conscious robot, then consciousness is everywhere. So that leads me to suggest, because we don't really want to think that chairs are conscious, floors are conscious, tables are conscious, digital counters are conscious, that leads me to suggest that just the execution of a computer program on its own is not sufficient to bring forth consciousness. And on that, on that note, I think my time is up and I'll take some questions. You seem to be very adamant about what consciousness isn't. What is consciousness then? Right. Um, I'm, I'm being adamant about one thing, and that is that the execution of a computer program will not be sufficient to bring rise to what we call the phenomenal experience of consciousness. Consciousness is many things. Consciousness is me remembering what I had for dinner yesterday. That's one aspect of consciousness. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the sort of consciousness that you get if I smacked you on the face. There's a certain feeling that is, that ah, I've just been hit on the face. Or you smell a particularly nice uh, dinner that, that someone's cooking for you, that, that smell of that food. Or that you see a particularly beautiful painting. That phenomenal experience, the, to use the jargon, this is the phenomenal experience of consciousness. And it's that that I'm saying, there's, I, if it is the case that a robot can be conscious, can consciously experience things, can consciously feel things, then consciousness is everywhere. Technically, that's, the, that's called panpsychism, the view that everything is conscious. So my fundamental claim is that if you really take seriously the notion that machines can be conscious, then you're led to believe that absolutely everything is conscious. Now, some people might be happy with that, but most people who work in university research labs are a bit shy from going down that route. So we tend to think the other case is true, that it's impossible to instantiate consciousness by the execution of a computer program. So what you're saying, we don't really know what consciousness is? Uh, not, not at all. What I'm saying is that you, I, you know what it feels like to uh, smell a nice smell or to feel pain. Yes? You, you understand what I mean? When yeah, I, of course. Right. What I'm saying is if it's the case that an, any computer program, you build me a program like Kevin Warwick did with his seven dwarves, and you say, this machine is conscious, it really feels. Now that's a, that's a claim that someone has made to me. If I run you through the, the full version of this argument, called the Dancing with the Pixies argument, which is quite a complicated argument, I'll give you a very brief summary of it today. That argument leads you to say that if that machine is conscious and smells the ineffable scent of a rose just like you do, then absolutely everything in the world is conscious. That's yeah, the view that that. Pan Sykes through. And that isn't a view that's taken very seriously in research labs. So most people reject the idea that a computer program can be conscious. It's called the reductio ad absurdum argument. You, you prove yeah. your conclusion by showing that the contrary leads to an absurd conclusion. Of that I understand. What is so special about us? What do you define as, what are you looking for in the consciousness? I'm not being carbon-centric or carbon-chauvinistic. I, I very much hope that we will get a good understanding of what human consciousness is and the biology that underpins human consciousness. The only very minor claim I'm making is that whatever consciousness is, it is not fully explained by the execution of a computer program. Okay, now, yeah. that might not yeah, seem very that. controversial to some of you in the room, but to some people that, that, uh, who are very embedded to the notion of strong artificial intelligence, that's a strong result to come with. All right, thanks. Hi, uh, nice talk. Um, so does that mean it would not be possible, in theory, to write a computer program that could completely simulate the brain? Right, you've got to be careful. There's a difference between simulation and duplication. I can write a computer program now that if I tell it uh, uh, a riddle or a joke, my output ha-ha or laugh, yeah? That's not to say that that computer program un really understands or really gets the joke. This is John Searle's Chinese room argument. So it may be the case that we can write computer systems that can um, simulate various aspects of human life, of human cognition. 
All right? That's an open question, an open scientific question, in which there are many people that call themselves computational neuroscientists, and that's what they do. They try to build computational models of neural processing, and that might be possible. There's a very big project in the EU but, uh, uh, that's investing a lot of research money on trying to build, um, uh, first of all, in simulation and then in hardware, large models of a cat brain. But even if you can simulate something really, really well, that's not the same as duplication. To bring this point alive, I can do a simulation, or the Met Office can do a really good simulation of a, of a rainstorm, but it won't make anyone who runs that simulation wet. Or more to the point, I can do a really good simulation of gold on my computer, but it doesn't make me rich. Simulation is not the same as duplication. So we might be able to simulate aspects of human cognition, but I, it is my contention that we won't instantiate them, we won't duplicate them merely by the execution of a computer program. Does that answer your question? Uh, in your presentation, uh, you spoke about that episode in which uh, the Russian nuclear sensors malfunctioned. Should we be afraid about action and decision taken by an artificial intelligence on our behalf? Very much so. That's the, precisely why I, I wanted to come and speak to you today, to bring... This is one of the campaigning issues I'm very passionate about. We're seeing at the moment America... America now has got more robot aircraft than it has aircraft piloted by humans. Now, the, at the moment, these robots are what are called drones. They're like remote control machines that someone in a little bunker safe in America is piloting around the world. They're not genuinely autonomous flying for themselves, seeking out their own targets and deciding when to engage. But I'll tell you this, that America is working to design just such robotic systems. If you think about it, it stands to reason. Because at the moment, these drones are generating huge amounts of intelligence that humans have got to go through and painstakingly sift through. That costs money. If we can get a machine to just fly itself, make its own kill decisions, that saves America a lot of money. So there's a great commercial impetus to try and move from drone technology, which already is annoying quite a few people, to fully autonomous weapon systems. Now, I think that this, apart from the political dangers of doing that, and I think there are many, as I try to show you, I think there are great technological dangers inherent when we start building autonomous weapons machines, colloquially killer robots. And when we start putting thousands of them in the service around the world, the likelihood that two opposing forces, perhaps Russia and America, perhaps China and America, perhaps China and Russia, will kick off and you get some automatic escalation, like with that book price, I think that danger is very, very real. When you have these systems armed with conventional weapons, that's bad enough. But just imagine if these systems are linked to nuclear weapons. Then we have a genuine existential threat about mankind's future. And that's why I think the time, it's not five years' time we should be worried about it. It's not one year's time. People ought to be campaigning against this now. And in fact, just this year, I've been at a meeting of the United Nations in Birmingham making this case. And one of my colleagues went to a meeting in Geneva and we've tried to get a moratorium on the fielding and deployment of autonomous weapons for these reasons. It's something you ought to be concerned about. I'm going to be dead in a few years' time, but you lot have got a lot more of your life to live. And it'd be, I think it's quite an alarming world that you might be moving into when you have large-scale deployment of autonomous killer robots. Thank you, Mark Bishop. Can I have a round of applause for Mark Bishop, please? Next up at five, we'll have Moon Ribas with a talk on cybernetics and how cybernetics can grow closer to nature.